Well, hello, I'm David Emmert, and I'm one of the pastors here at Celebration Baptist Church. And we're back in our studio environment again today because we're continuing our sermon series called Inspired. And to go along with this, we've got these things called Inspired Conversations. It's just a group study that you can join in with you and the folks who are kind of going through the pandemic in your bubble. So get your bubble together, watch the sermon, then go to our website or our app, click on Inspired, and there's a Bible study that goes along with the sermon that we're talking about right now today. We want our television work to be at the same pace that our live work and our live stream is. So that's the reason we do a special studio edition of this sermon series so that you can keep up and join us in an inspired conversation study. Hey, over the last two weeks, we've seen what Jesus said about himself and we've seen what he says about you and me. And today we're going to hear about what Jesus says about what it means to be one of his followers. So let's pray and we're going to dig right in. Father, thank you for this chance for us to be together today. Uh, We desperately need to see healing in our land. We need to see health restored. We need to see this virus abate and go away. We desperately need to see peace in our cities. And so, Lord, we just come to you asking that you move in our midst. For the next few moments, though, Lord, we're going to be looking at your word. We're going to be hearing from Jesus about what it means to be his follower. So open our minds and open our hearts because we're going to be really challenged today. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, over the years, I've talked openly about the kind of home that I grew up in. Both my mom and dad were rock-solid Christ followers, and they were outspoken about their faith. They also made sure that their love for God was evident in the way that they treated other people. I remember my mom sitting in the same spot on the edge of the couch with her Bible in her hands every single day. The margins of the pages of her Bible were just filled with notes, and there was always this little stubby number two pencil sitting nearby. As a kid, I was always amazed at how sharp she kept that little pencil, which is probably why it was so stubby. She kept sharpening and sharpening and sharpening. Mom would sit in that spot and prepare her Sunday school lesson. She taught a Sunday school class for years, and she encouraged scores of people in my little small town to pursue their relationship with Jesus Christ. My dad also loved the Lord. He he built a small town medical practice around serving those in the greatest of need. I would go to work with him and I'd play in the little office area where the filing cabinets were. And when you'd look at the cabinets, there was this little sticker uh, attached to them. And it had a simple three color code uh, to be used for all the filing. If somebody's name on their file was on a red label, it meant that they didn't pay anything at all for their care. It was just free. If their name was on a yellow label, it meant that they were charged 50%. And if their name was on a green label, it meant that they were charged 100%, the normal rate for their services. I remember as a kid looking at those drawers as they stood open while the office staff did their work. And I wondered how it made sense for there to be so many red labels on the files in the drawers. I know that that was a long time ago and the practice of medicine has changed greatly over the years and it's just not possible for doctors today to conduct their practices the same way that my dad did all those years ago. But to this day, my dad stands out as a model of generosity and compassion because of the way that he conducted himself. It was no wonder that my mom was the person who explained to me what it meant to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd been talking with my mom off and on for weeks about how to become a Christian. So one night, my mom and I knelt by her bed, and she took out this very 1970s looking Bible. I remember that Bible to this day. I was so curious about it, I went online to see if I could find a picture, and sure enough, there it was. It's crazy how the little details like that can stick out in your mind from when you were just a kid. Doesn't this Bible just scream 1970s at you? Anyway, my mom and I knelt by the bed, and she helped me understand how to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 3.16 just sort of laid it out. You probably know this verse. For God so loved the world in this way, He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Without a doubt, these are the most famous words ever spoken by Jesus. You almost have certainly heard this verse of Scripture. And if you break this little verse down, it makes a couple of things crystal clear. 
One, it makes it clear that everyone faces the possibility of perishing. That's a terrible thing to consider, but Jesus himself wants us to know that the possibility of eternal separation from God is a truth each one of us needs to take seriously. But also in this verse, Jesus gives us good news. Rescuing people from an eternity separated from God and bringing them into eternity with God is absolutely paramount to both the Father and the Son. God has seen us in our condition and He sent Jesus to save us. Jesus makes it possible for everyone, everywhere, who places their confidence in Him to have eternal life. Now remember my mom making this incredibly clear to me as a young boy. And so I accepted Christ's offer. That was a really good day. Maybe you had people in your life like my mom and dad. Maybe it was your parents too. Maybe they were there for you and they talked with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Maybe for you it was a grandparent who played that critical and pivotal role for you. A few weeks ago, we had baptisms in our Celebration Baptist Church family. Because of all the social distancing requirements that we've got going on right now, we decided to hold those baptisms in an outdoor swimming pool all around the community so that everybody could be safe and hang out and enjoy each other outdoors. It was a mix of kids and adults being baptized, and I was so proud of all of them. It was a big deal for them to take the step of identifying with Jesus Christ. Now, I was also really proud of those parents. I mean, for them, this was a banner day, and I loved getting to hear their stories about how they were able to lead their kids to Christ and see them celebrate together in this moment of baptism. Man, that is a huge moment for any parent. I, I love stories like that. It may be, though, that your story is totally different than that. Maybe you grew up in a home where Jesus was seldom, if ever, mentioned. You went to church on occasion with a few friends. Maybe you went to a youth group a time or two because there was a girl that you were interested in. But that was the extent of your exposure to church. Or maybe for you, you grew up in a home where people professed to be Christian, but you saw some really ungodly things there. What was modeled for you wasn't Christian at all, and it left you wondering if you want anything to do with Christianity. You're still recovering from that exposure to people who, by all appearances, were Christians in name only. Now, regardless of your story, regardless of what you know or what you don't know about accepting Jesus, you may not have had much information about what it means to actually follow Jesus. There's a reason for this. For decades here in the United States, we've talked a great deal about making a decision for Christ. We've rightly talked about the reality of our need to accept Jesus' grace and mercy, but very little is ever said about the demands of what it means to be a Christ follower. And that's to our disadvantage. It probably explains why 70% of all Americans still claim to be Christians when there's little evidence at all to support that claim. When you look at the teachings of Jesus, a different pattern begins to emerge. While Jesus encourages people to make the choice to become one of His followers, He also talks, talks openly about just how hard it is to follow Him day in and day out. And He fully expects everyone who calls on His name to be in the trenches following Him from the first moments they profess to believe in Him. To help you understand what I mean, let's take a look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Here's what it says. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's another famous piece of Scripture. It's called the Great Commission. And it's really straightforward, isn't it? Jesus tells His disciples that He's sending them out under the authority of God to go and raise up people who want to be Christ followers. They are to baptize these new believers. That means give them a means to identify with the body of Christ through the symbol of baptism and then teach them to observe everything that Christ has commanded. Now, let's reverse engineer this statement in Scripture so that we can understand what Jesus expects future Christ followers to do. Future Christ followers are to receive those who have been sent, identify with Christ by being baptized, and then learn and do everything Jesus has commanded. Nowhere does it say that someone should think of themselves as a Christian just because they've heard about Jesus from someone who's been sent to tell them. 
Nowhere does it say that it's a good thing for someone to be baptized and then just stop making any forward progress in their pursuit of Christ. Nowhere does it say that obeying the commands of Christ is somehow optional. Jesus commands His disciples to go, to baptize, to teach everyone to obey everything. And it makes it pretty clear that His new followers would be those who would receive the gospel, get baptized, then learn and obey all of Christ's commands. But for many people in the church, that's just not their experience. They hear about Jesus, they accept what they hear, and they're baptized. But they never actually fulfill what Jesus intends. They never follow through and follow Jesus. Because the job is left incomplete, many people are left wondering if they're really Christians or not. They're left wondering why their experience with Christ seems to be so empty. Now, if that sounds like your experience, I want you to pay really careful attention over the next two weeks. Because over the next two weeks, we're going to hear from Jesus about what He expects from someone claiming to be a Christ follower. Next week, we're going to look at how following Christ influences the way we treat other people. After all, following Jesus isn't something that we do in a vacuum. It has influence on every relationship that we have. But today, we're going to listen to the words of Jesus Himself, and we're going to learn what He expects from you and me personally as His followers. What's the personal cost of following Jesus? Well, Jesus talks a great deal about what it means to follow Him. But so often, when He's on topic, He uses the same basic language over and over again. It's like He's got something really important for us to get. So He keeps repeating the same idea in a variety of different contexts so that we'll finally understand what He means. So what does He say over and over again? What's He describing when He talks about what it means to follow Him? Well, here it is reduced down to just a single verse. Luke 9.23 says, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Pretty straightforward. If you want to come after Jesus, you deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Him. That's great, but what does it mean? Well, to understand this, we have to understand the way that people would have received that statement in the day that Jesus spoke it. Today we look at the cross as a piece of jewelry to be worn around the neck. Everybody gets in on this. Here's a picture of Justin Bieber. How about Selena Gomez or The Weeknd? They're all sporting crosses. <laughs> Clearly, wearing a cross can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Maybe it's a statement of faith or maybe it's just a fashion statement. <laughs> it really depends on who's wearing it. But in Jesus' day, Picking up a cross and following someone only meant one thing. It meant that you were convicted to die. A person who was to be executed by crucifixion would be forced to lift the cross beam across his shoulders and then follow the soldiers who were leading him to be executed. If you were carrying a cross, everyone who saw you would know that your life was over. You were a dead man walking. Your identity was no longer found in your job. Your identity was no longer found in your network. Worth. Your identity was no longer found in your family. It wasn't founded in your hopes and in your dreams anymore. Your identity wasn't found in your hobbies or your favorite sports team. All of those things were lost to you. By the time people saw you carrying your cross, you'd been stripped of your pride and position. You'd effectively been reduced to a nobody. Your time on this earth was dangerously short. So when Jesus connects the reality of the cross with following Him, everybody would have understood what He meant. Taking up your cross meant to lose everything in favor of following Jesus. You die to yourself. You say goodbye to your hopes and dreams. You say goodbye to all of your plans. Those things are dead to you and you're dead to them. You give up everything about yourself in order to follow Jesus completely. In a sense, you die to yourself and you live for Christ. Which is exactly what Galatians 2.20 says. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And Jesus says this isn't a one-off. This is something that you do every single day. Meaning, this decision will upend everything you might think should be ordinary about your life. Nothing in your experience will ever be processed the same way again. Look at how Jesus talks with a series of people who come to Him saying they're ready to follow Him once they've taken care of other everyday priorities and concerns first. We find it in Luke 9, verse 57. 
As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, First let me go and bury my father. But he told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, when you look at these requests, none of them are unreasonable. The first guy doesn't sound as if he has any reservations at all. He just wants to follow Jesus. But for some reason, as Jesus sizes him up, it sounds as if he's talking the would-be follower out of it. Jesus says, hey, before you jump on board, I want you to think about the life I'm living. I'm camping out a lot. I'm rejected a lot. And I spend a lot of time outside. This is a hard life. Another guy comes up and says, I've got to make funeral arrangements for my dad. Now, some scholars think that this man's father was in the last few days of his life. And this guy just wants to spend those last days with his dad. Now, that's perfectly understandable. Uh, being there for the last few moments of life with a loved one is a painful but treasured opportunity nobody would want to miss out on. Other people say that this man's dad had already died. He just wanted to make sure that all the funeral arrangements were taken care of so that his dad would have a proper burial. Either way, these are decisions that people make every single day. It's extraordinary to think that anybody would miss out on these things. But how does Jesus respond to this seemingly reasonable request? Jesus says that following Him and making disciples is far more important. Then another person comes to Jesus and says, Hey, let me properly say goodbye to my family and show them some love before I take off. But Jesus shuts him down, telling him there's no turning back from following Him, not even for family. Ouch! This isn't the only time that Jesus makes it clear that taking up your cross and following Him is more important than your own family. Look at Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38. The person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves sons or son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now this seems really harsh, doesn't it? I think this is particularly hard for Americans because we've made so much out of the idea that to be a Christian is to be all about your family, right? If I'm going to be a Christian father, then I've got to make it all about my family. If I'm going to be a Christian mother, I've got to make it all about my family. And it's absolutely true that your family is important. We've got a biblical obligation to do everything in our power to raise our kids to be Christ followers in their own right. It's hard to do it, and it's critically important that we pull this off. But Jesus teaches us here that while loving our family is very important, it isn't more important than loving Him. Again, we see Jesus using the idea of taking up our cross and following Him, even if it means placing Jesus ahead of our family. If we're going to understand how Jesus could say following Him is more important than our family, we need to take a look at Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and more, most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Jesus is asked by someone which of the commands in the Old Testament were most important. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.5. Our first priority is to love God. We love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Nothing can compete with our affections for God. Then Jesus quotes Leviticus 19.18 and says that second only to loving God, we should love others more than we love ourselves. Jesus lays these two commands out with great attention and detail. He doesn't say, hey, here are two really important commands, and I'll give them to you in no particular order. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say that. He's teaching us something important here. The order matters. Love God first, then love others more than yourself. Now, why that order? Because we can't love others rightly until we love God rightly. Now, let's bring this home. If we love our family more than we love Jesus, we've upset the entire concept of loving God supremely. You can't carry the cross of Christ if you don't understand this. 
In my home, we use the words, I love you all the time. It's one of the things I love about the culture in my family. I want Pam to know how I feel about her, so I tell her, and I tell her often. I want my son and daughter to know how I feel about them, so every time I speak with them, I always tell them that I love them. It's just a really common thing to hear in the immigrant household to hear those words, I love you. Now, I know that my wife loves me because she tells me. This is very reciprocal. She tells me all the time that she loves me too. But she also reminds me that she understands this principle of Jesus. So from time to time, Pam will look at me all sweetly and she'll say, I love you most next to Jesus. <laughs> she says it all to me all the time. She's saying, hey, you're awesome and you're important, but you're not Jesus. She wants me to know that her affection for me is second to her affection for Christ. And you know what I say to that? Amen. That's God's will. That's what Jesus is calling her to do. It's never felt so good to be told that I'm a distant second ever in my life as when my wife tells me she loves Jesus more than she loves me. She's saying, hey, I want you to know my priorities are right. I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind because I love Him rightly. I can also love you rightly. Now, it's mission critical that we get this right because if we love anyone or anything more than Jesus, there's always a possibility that, that person could come back and interfere with our allegiance to Jesus. Jesus talks to us about this very possibility. A second ago, we looked at Matthew 10. Let's go back there and let's look at a few more verses from that passage. Let's begin in Matthew 10, verse 34. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The person who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. When you face opposition for the sake of the gospel, especially when it comes from those who are close to you, it's a tremendously tempting thing to turn away from following Christ. But you, you can't allow your affections for your family knock the cross of Christ off your shoulders. Over the years, I've met a lot of people who faced opposition from their families. I used to live in Ethiopia, and when I was there, I worked with young men and women who'd been thrown out of their home because they'd accepted Christ. Others had been shut out of the local economy, while still others had been rendered homeless or friendless, all because they accepted Jesus. I've been stunned to watch how they faithfully clung to the cross of Jesus Christ. They moved in with friends. They slept on the floor of the church. They lived off the hospitality of strangers, all for the name of Jesus. Now, because we live in the Deep South here in the United States, we miss this. Because in our region of the world, it's still very acceptable to be a Christian. But even here, if you're a passionate follower of Jesus, pushback is all but guaranteed. Years ago, when I was early in my ministry, I was a youth pastor in a small church. And while I was there, I was working with a young girl named Sylvia. She had recently come to know Jesus Christ. And for this girl, there was no disconnect between accepting Jesus and following Him by taking up her cross daily. This young girl's life had been transformed by the gospel. And she was hungry to learn the Bible. She was hungry to learn to, uh, to be around other Christians and learn from them. She ran hard after her newfound faith, and it was exciting to watch. But there was a problem for Sylvia. Her mom and dad were Christmas and Easter Christians. You know what I mean by that, right? They were the kind of people who showed up at church two times a year. Then when they were all done with the holidays, they were all done with Jesus, at least until the next holidays rolled around. In their view, life made perfect sense if you just kept Jesus in His place. So when their daughter showed all this passion for Jesus and suddenly wanted to be in church all the time, they told her to knock it off. They became unsupportive and even hostile toward her. Soon after she became a believer, I noticed that Sylvia would always show up early anytime there was an event or Bible study at the church. Now, this was hard for me because I was a young single guy at the time, and I didn't want to be alone in the building with this girl. It just wouldn't have been appropriate. So finally, as nicely as I could, I just asked her, Sylvia, why do you always get here so early? 
She said to me, because the only way that I can get here to church is to walk five miles from my house. My family has refused to bring me to church anymore because they say I've gone overboard with this Jesus stuff. So I leave early so that I arrive on time. I, I don't want to miss anything. That was Sylvia's story. The opposition she faced in carrying her cross and following Jesus came from inside her own household. But Sylvia set out to be worthy of the affections of Christ. She wasn't going to let anything stop her. But Jesus doesn't just call us to endure hardship when it comes from those who are close to us. When you look across history, you see people who were faced with life and death situations because of the gospel. Jesus' response to them is the same that it would be to us. No matter the cost, keep on taking up your cross and following me. Here's an example in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wants to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of Me will find it. Just a couple of weeks ago, I received an email from a friend of mine who works with church planters in several African countries. Here's a part of what he had to say to me in that email. Recently, in an area not far from my home, churches were burned and Christians were persecuted. Just a couple of months ago, in an area just west of here, pastors were killed in the pulpit. But God has done so many amazing things in these places. Some have come to know Christ because of men who are willing to die for the gospel. These guys want to die doing something for Him. But most of them are protected by God and are still doing God's work. His protection for them is amazing. I recently learned that they have baptized 23 people. The militia in the area weren't happy about this. They gave these men a warning not to preach anymore. But two of these guys told them boldly, We will not stop preaching and baptizing. We will stop when we die. But as long as we have life, we can't quit because His love is burning inside of us. The soldiers were surprised at their boldness, but became very angry. They wanted to shoot them, but their leader told them, Leave them alone for now. We'll come for them when we come back next week. The militiamen left, but they have not returned, and it's now been three months. Man, when I read my friend's email, I felt so incredibly small. I've had the honor over the years of meeting and working with a lot of African evangelists and church planters just like these men. I know their boldness. I know their passion for the gospel. Most of these men and women live on pennies a day. They've endured untold hardships. They face constant opposition from inside their family and from without. They've been kicked out of their homes by their own family. They've been shot at. They've had grenades thrown at their home. They've been beaten and stoned all because they profess Jesus. And this isn't years or decades ago. This is real time. People like this exemplify what it means when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, our circumstances are not like theirs. I mean, we, we may have to wear a mask to go to church, but by God's grace, we're not facing persecution the way they are. And I pray that we never will. But I must never forget that as a Christian, my mandate, my command from Christ, it's no different than theirs. Jesus says to me, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Just as he said this to those church planters in Africa that I just read about, just as he said this to Sylvia, the young girl that I knew all those years ago, he says it to you and me too. Now, I hope it's clear what Jesus had in mind when He invites us to follow Him. Jesus is telling us that when we become Christ followers, nothing is to prevent us from following Him with singular passion and focus. We don't let ourselves become distracted. We don't let ourselves compromise. We don't allow our own priorities or hopes or dreams knock us off of being a disciple. We don't let our affections, even our affections for our family, slow us down. Even death itself isn't a big enough threat to lead us to reconsider following Christ with passion and intensity. We live in a world that is filled with competing ideas and philosophies. And we live here in the United States in a place where tremendous comfort is made available to us. So we're a people who have a great deal to lose when it comes to following Christ.
So when you hear that following Jesus means taking up a cross to die to self and making everything and everyone you know a distant second to Him, it really sounds outrageous. But I also believe at this moment, Jesus has been calling you. And many of you know it. You know that He has been preparing your heart and soul for this very time. And I want to challenge you to abandon everything just as we've been talking about and truly follow Him. And for some of you, this is the first time you've ever seriously considered this. Now, you've got a clearer picture of what following Jesus is all about. So let me encourage you. This is a good day to make a life-changing decision. You don't need me to tell you that your life isn't headed where it needs to be headed. You don't need me to tell you that even by your own standards, let alone God's standards, your life falls short. Maybe you're sitting there right now thinking, I decided to accept Jesus when I was a kid, but honestly, I haven't done anything with that decision since. By no measure have I taken up my cross and followed Jesus. Hey, I'm just asking you to be honest with yourself. There are some of us who've been through this church thing for a long time, but somewhere along the way, our hearts have grown cold. And if that's your story, today's the right day to engage with the call of Christ in your life. Today is the day to make the decision to abandon everything else and place the cross of Christ squarely on your shoulders. So I want for all of us to take some time right now and just allow the Spirit of God to really have access to what's going on inside of us. Let's just push back from the busyness of the week and let's take some heart time. I want you to know that Jesus is worthy of your love and of your affection. He made you. He loves you. He died for you and He stands as a risen Savior who makes a real relationship with God possible. So let's just pray together right now. God, here's my trust. Here's my plans. Here's my dreams. Here's my affections. I pour it all out before you. You can have everything that I have, every possession, every relationship, my family, my girlfriend, my boyfriend. I make them all secondary to you and you alone. So Jesus, I trust you and I ask you to live in me. Lead me and accomplish your plans through my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being a part of our worship time together today here at Celebration. I just want to remind you, we talked about some really important things today. We talked about what it means to initiate a relationship with Jesus Christ that includes following Him, taking up our cross, and making His leadership paramount in our life every single day and in every single relationship that we have. Now this is a lot to take in. It's a lot to process. And you may have questions about what to do next. So here's what I'd like for you to do. Go to our website at celebrationbaptist.church and simply click on the link that takes you to Fresh Start. There you can begin this whole process of following Jesus Christ with all of your heart. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you.